All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Fior. I, uh, I started San Diego Digital Designers, uh, and that's uh, kind of the motivating force for why we're here tonight. So I get to talk to you. Uh, big thank you, of course, to our host, Blink. We are in their building right now. Okay. Hmm? Uh, and also, hi, we have uh, some people live streaming. So hello, distant people, invisible people. Thank you to our sponsor, Cozy. That's me. <laughs> uh, so uh, thanks to me for the pizza. Uh, that's weird. Uh, I should have had you say that part. Um, I wanted a, a note, uh, so maybe Brent actually can, can talk about this a little bit later, but um, Blink is putting on a, uh, a conference in Seattle in March, and uh, San Diego Digital Designers members can get a couple hundred bucks off with this code. Um, check it out. I'll let you put a little more uh, context to that. Um, the group, uh, for those of you who are here and don't know much about the group, uh, we are primarily a Slack group, uh, but we do these meetups in person. We, uh, as of yesterday, we have 408 designers in there. Uh, people are joining much more quickly than ever before. The group is growing nicely now. Uh, anybody who's in the group, I urge you to post to the group. It's very quiet in there, like per person. Uh, just, if everybody just said a little something once in a while. Uh, friendly people, nobody bites. Um, but we are, yeah, look, we are getting hundreds of posts a week anyway. Um, we've covered, we have uh, channels for jobs and tools and the things that are on the screen right now. Um, we have these monthly meetups for these bigger talks and then uh, every week or so we have a, a meal-based meetup, so lunch or breakfast or something like that, just something a little bit more, half a dozen people just chatting, that kind of thing. And that's that's kind of the, my goal with the group, is to have more of a, an introvert-friendly, non-big event, non-networking, non-industry uh, kind of uh, hum of connection for all of us. Whether you're a freelancer that's always working at your own desk and you just would love to talk to somebody else sometimes, or you're at one of the bigger agencies and you never talk to anybody who's not on your team, you need to get out in the world a little bit, so come talk to some other people. Uh, so. For those of you who haven't joined, uh, sddd.org, it's free and all that kind of thing. Um, and it's easy. Um, so my company is called Cozy. I did want to ask, by the way, how many, I'm just curious to get a sense of the, the group here. Who brought business cards? Oh, a whistle, too. That's awesome. Uh, thank you for the whistle. Um, cool. Everybody, trade your cards. Um, that's unrelated to anything. I don't know. I just was curious. So um, we're Cozy. We are a design and marketing shop. We're based in South Park, um, and everybody has to have their thing. Our thing is uh, I want to do as little as possible, but no less. So uh, let me back up and explain a little bit what that means. So um, I've been doing this a long time, and in my opinion, uh, we've seen the whole industry is doing, has done a great job of being focused on the user. Uh, we have uh, user-friendly user interfaces being designed by user experience designers. You know, we've got a lot of user stuff, but I feel like we've lost sight of the, uh, another perspective, which is the, the business. And I'm not some big capitalist pig, but there's a, there's a whole raft of these smaller and medium-sized businesses that uh, I think are not uh, getting the attention they deserve from, from, from our community. Um, and, you know, I'm bothered by this poorly designed world we all live in with its shitty menus and its dumb websites and its bad doors and all that kind of stuff, and I want to help fix all that stuff. Um, and, on, and I do care about users. I've been in arguments for decades. Thank you. Mm. That's nice. Uh, I've been getting in arguments for decades with, every, with clients and developers and marketing managers and douchebags and sales and everybody. About, about advocating for the users. So like, I do care about the users, not to put them um, out of the picture, but uh, any user only interacts with the business for a short period of time, and I want to, interact, I want to improve the world for more people that are in, in just flowing through the world dealing with all these businesses. So I don't think we do that by shoving every business through some idealized uh, design process that uh, kind of feels good for us and might be too, too costly or too risky for a business, maybe to the point they don't even take they don't even take it on. So I'd rather do less and do 
then, then do nothing for, for these, these companies. Um, you know, like not, not, so like not every business needs to spend three weeks on personas and invest 25 grand in some, in, let's say in personas. Not every business, uh, not every business, or sort of not, not, not every interaction, sorry, uh, needs to, needs, needs us to develop a user journey. Not every word needs to be rewritten. Not every page needs to be relaunched. You know, like we, we can, we can break this down into much smaller pieces and do a lot of good with our big, giant, beautiful designer brains. Um, only when, you know, the budget is there and the problem is big enough should we start adding that complexity to the process, in, in my opinion. There's lots of smaller problems to be solved. So, so I call that, that, I kind of ball that all up into an approach that I call rational design. Um, I should mention we are based on, we're walking out of the frame here, but, you know, we're based uh, around uh, contractors. So I'm always building out the bench. I'll probably hit up back on that in a second. Um, I've talked to probably half of the people in this room about that very topic. Um, but so this, this rational design, it works. So uh, just this week, we were pulling up our numbers for one of our clients, and this is just year over year numbers. This is a client, we were very much taking this tact of like, this is not a client with a lot of money, but we are just doing a, a lot of smart, focused, ongoing blog writing, content marketing, dis like, like design, light design work for, for whatever they need. And it works, these numbers are great. They're all green, green is good. So like I said, we're always looking for for contractors, I'm looking for motivated, intentional, careful, thoughtful kinds of uh, kinds of designers, and we work with businesses that are, I think the way I said it here, which is probably a mouthful or confusing, if nothing else, we work with businesses that are that are too big not to have their own design and marketing teams. Uh, so there's our URL. That's my email address. Um, feel free to to hit me up. I made the community. Clearly, I care about you guys, so I would love to talk with with anybody about any of this. Um, I should also mention our next one of these has already been scheduled. It's been published. It's on Meetup. It's on January 16th. It's not design related. It's about getting shit done. It's by uh, Rachel Govin, who's in our group, and she's a productivity expert, and she's going to help us sort of unstick our, ourselves. If you kind of find yourself with a never-ending to-do list that kind of just keeps trailing away from you, and you're not you're not making the progress, you're not feeling good about your your the way you're hacking away at it. Uh, she's got a lot of a lot of tools to help us with that. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brent, and that's all I have to say. Okay, I'm going to walk away. Thanks, Lee. Um, <clears throat> I'm really a big fan of of Lee. We we sort of have navigated in the same circles for a long time, and it wasn't until about a year ago maybe two years ago now, I've been at Blink two years, um, that we finally had the opportunity to collide inside of San Diego, and I think you're doing a lot of great stuff for the community, so thank you very much for all that you do here and for the opportunity for me to talk to you guys tonight. Um, this is really weird because I updated my speaker notes. I'm gonna press refresh and let's just hope this works out okay for me. It didn't. That's great. Um, <laughs> So, well, hello. Uh, my name's Brent Summers. I'm the director of marketing at Blink, and I'm going to completely roll without speaker notes now because I decided to try to refresh, unless, Mac, you can maybe help me out while I kill some time. This is uh, our IT generalist in San Diego. His name's Mac. He's a superhero. Uh, so while I'm working on that, uh, I am, well, he's working on that. Um, who has ever been to Blink before? About half the room. So for those of you that don't know, Blink is a user experience research and design studio and we're based in Seattle with five studios around the nation. I'm not here to give you a big pitch on Blink. Um, I will tell you a little bit more about myself soon. Those are the same speaker notes. It's totally cool. I'll, I can work with that. It's better than none. And we have the live captions running now. So for those of you at home, I'm glad you can mute this and just watch my words be printed. And if anybody needs that device, that service, I'm excited to be able to provide that to you. Uh, so after all that, I'm Brent Summers, Director of Marketing at Blink. I probably already said that. I went to Cowboy Star and had a old fashioned. <laughs> this is my dog Midas, and he's really cute. He's a 75 pound golden doodle. You can't tell he's that big. 
Um, I also have a really cute husband. He's in the back corner there. His name is Robert. Wave. Hello. Uh, the yes, sir. Uh, so Robert is my better half and is also a drama teacher. So this is the first time he's hearing this talk, and I'm going to get lots of notes at the end of the night. Uh, and you all should do the same. This is my second time giving this talk uh, publicly, and I'm giving it again at Convey UX in March. Uh, you got a flyer for Convey UX, right, in your seat. It's pretty obvious. Okay. If you flip it over, there's a promotional code, SDDD. Uh, there's a $200 off discount, uh, and then we're going to give uh, the, the group here um, a small commission so that we can continue to host events like this for you in the future. So if you choose to go to Convey, use that code. Uh, Leo, who's in the crowd, has been to Convey a few times. Uh, he can vouch for it. <laughs> um, great. So I mentioned Blink is a user experience design company. There's a crazy looping video that's going to like eventually spin. Yeah, cool dots and stuff. Um, so we work with companies to make meaningful digital products, brands, and experiences. Um, and likely, we, we take this sort of like rational approach to design, um, which involves a lot of research. Uh, so unlike some design companies, we really put users at the forefront of our process. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, company was founded in 2000. We're 150 people. I already mentioned we have five studios. Um, but like most agencies, we have a lot of amazing clients. Um, so this is a few of them. I mentioned that Blink is headquartered in Seattle, so you'll see a lot of Pacific Northwest companies up there, right? Microsoft and Amazon. Um, one of my favorites is Starbucks. Uh, Raise your hand if you've ever ordered a coffee on the Starbucks app. Yeah, so we helped with that. Um, we also helped with the Domino's Pizza Tracker and uh, lots of other things that you probably have, have interacted with in your life. Um, there's two primary ways that we help customers. The first is improving existing experiences. Wow, it really is better if I hold it closer to my mouth. Uh, so we help customers improve existing experiences. So those are things that are going to ship in the near term, in the next like one to six months. And we've done that for Nike with the Run app, Oculus with the Go and Quest headsets, and Starbucks, like I mentioned before. Uh, we also do a fair amount of future strategic initiatives. We call it envisioning. Uh, those things ship usually in like 12 to 36 months, and they involve extensive user research, uh, comprehensive prototyping and testing, and oftentimes dedicated teams or multiple sub-projects within a large program. So USAA, NASA, and Amazon are all examples of that. I could go on and on, but like, you're not here to learn about Blink. You want to hear about the UX flywheel. That is why you're here, right? To hear about the UX flywheel? So the UX flywheel is uh, a strategy model that we've developed at Blink to help explain how UX can benefit marketers. Uh, I'm a marketer who works in UX. So for me, this was an easy sell, but this is like a representation of 15 years of my collective experience that I've distilled down under the pressure of I had a talk to give in October and needed to figure out what my premise was going to be. And the UX flywheel is what it was. So I'm going to do that in three parts. Um, first. Um, my notes are really, I'm sorry, I updated my notes earlier and it, it's really messing with me. Um, so first, I'm going to share with you the definition of strategy. Uh, then I'm going to share with you the UX strategy model that we've developed. And then I'm going to share some case studies. Um, before I do that, though, I, I wanted to share uh, the inspiration for this talk. Uh, Everybody uses LinkedIn? Yeah. Cool. Does anybody know who Dave Gerhardt is? Wow. Definitely designers. So I'm a designer with a big D. I work design adjacent. I'm a marketer in the design industry. Dave Gerhardt is this really influential guy. He's got like thousands and thousands of followers on LinkedIn. Uh, he works worked for a company called Drift. Um, and he put this, this up on LinkedIn several months ago, and it really was like thought-provoking for me, right? I'm like, wow, 99% of people don't want to be marketed to. It's totally true. 99% uh, of people only read headlines or tweets. Totally true. And 99% people are skeptical. 99% of people are skeptical of sales. Totally true. So I'm, I'm sitting here like watching these comments come in, and I'm thinking about how I'm going to respond to this thing, because Dave and I are buddies, and I'm like, I got to get in on this conversation. And I'm watching these comments come in, and it's like, oh, I, I have a million and one software tools. And 
you know, I do videos and webinars, and those are really good for engaging customers, and I use live chat. Drift is a live chat tool, so they were just sucking up. Um, I use customer data and personalization, and I use direct mail. Who the hell uses direct mail? Does it still work? It did for somebody, you know? Uh, and then somebody else was like, I'm jumping in on influencer marketing, and like, I'm watching all of this, again, just thinking about like, what am I gonna say to this? And I decided that was just a bunch of tactics, right? Like, all of those things are great, but what does that mean without strategy? And so then, like, what is strategy? How am I gonna, like, up-level a conversation? So, I'm gonna give you a definition of strategy from the Oxford English Dictionary, I think is who Google uses, and then I'm gonna give you a really vivid example of it. Jorge, raise your hand. This is Jorge, he's our design director. Uh, Jorge and I were talking about boxing once, and um, I realized that boxing was a really good metaphor for strategy, so there's a little foreshadow. So, the definition of strategy is a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major goal or aim. I didn't read it exactly as it stayed there. It's fine. Um, so, a plan of action, right? So, strategy is made up of tactics, and that's why tactics and strategy are so often confused, because Strategy is tactics. They're just like stringed together, right? Those tactics are selected to solve a particular problem in a specific order. And that's what design is, right? Problem solving. So design, strategy, tactics. It's like it's confusing, but, but not really. You just have to parse it. Um, and they're designed to achieve this big overall aim. That's the thing that I think really separate tactics from stra strategy is like, what am I doing today versus what am I gonna do six months from now? How does what I'm gonna do today help me achieve that bigger goal? So here's an example of a big, hairy, audacious goal. This is Muhammad Ali and George Foreman fighting at the Rumble in the Jungle. Who's familiar with this fight? Cool, so some of you will know this and some of you are gonna get schooled. I got schooled by Jorge a few months ago. So uh, George Foreman, the, the guy with the grill, he was favored to win four to one because he was like much, much more powerful than Muhammad Ali. So Muhammad Ali knew that he was gonna have to beat Foreman, not on power, but with a strategic plan. So the first thing that Muhammad Ali did in preparing for this fight was look at the evidence. He watched hours and hours of footage of George Foreman fighting other people. Everyone knew that Foreman was this powerful boxer. Uh, in fact, he was so powerful that his longest fight was just five rounds. Just five rounds. So it was clear from the footage to Muhammad Ali that George Foreman had this like consistent style. Uh, what he would do is he would paw as it is as, at his opponents. He would like do this long reach thing and that would draw his opponents open and then he would land punches in his, opponent, in his opponent's midsection. And so Ali examined all that data and he developed a three-part strategy to, defend, to, to work against that. The first thing that Muhammad Ali did was uh, dodge and counter. And if you study Muhammad Ali's career, which I did after my talk with Jorge, um, he, made, he had made an entire career out of this. He was really good at sort of like dodging a punch and then countering with a jab or whatever. Um, you probably know the adage, fly like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Yeah, so, so he applied that here. But you can't win a championship fight by like dodging and countering. So the next thing he had to do was, was figure out how when Foreman landed those punches, he was gonna break up that momentum. And so Foreman sometimes would like land some combo attacks and Ali would grab his head. You guys are probably all familiar with like the boxer hug. It's like, why the hell are they doing that? Well, if you, if you s listen to boxing breakdowns like I did in preparing for this talk, you learn that that's a way of breaking up the momentum. So Foreman would have momentum and he was beating up on Ali and this was a way for him to pause that. Okay, that's pretty standard. But what's really interesting when you watch the replay footage is you can see Muhammad Ali shouting in George's ear. Is that all you got? Give me some, George. And so Muhammad Ali was like egging him on, like beat me up, dude, that's all you got? Come on. Keep, and he was trying to keep the pace of the match nice and high. Remember, George Foreman only, his longest bout was five rounds. 
So Ali had actually trained for this. Uh, in his preparation for this, he would go into the, bo into the boxing ring in his training gyms and he would just ask people to beat him up, just hit him in the midsection and beat him up. So he was training for endurance. And that stamina is perhaps the most famous part of the match. Maybe not. Does anybody know what the most famous part is? The rope-a-dope? Yeah. So the rope-a-dope. This is like the laws of physics benefiting Muhammad Ali. Um, so when George Foreman hits you, it hurts, right? He's a big dude. What Muhammad Ali did was he, he leaned against the ropes in a, in a way that the ropes would then absorb some of the impact. The, the power from George Foreman's punches were transferred into the ropes, and that helped him sustain more stamina. So, right, George Foreman is exerting all the energy he could possibly exert, and, and Muhammad Ali is just taking a fraction of that. Everything good? Okay. How many streamers we got? Hello, 20 streamers at home. <laughs> um, so on TV, this looked really terrible for Ali, right? Because this was an innovative strategy. Nobody had ever done this before. People thought Ali was getting his ass kicked. But this was all part of his strategy. He was using the laws of physics. It took eight long and brutal rounds. But Ali came out on top after really coming alive in the sixth rounds. It's really an incredible fight and a great demonstration of strategy. All right, this is what you came for, the UX flywheel. So, uh, the UX flywheel is a strategy model with three components, not unlike Muhammad Ali's. Um, and the idea with a flywheel is that with each spin of the flywheel, uh, you gain more momentum and more power. So that's the metaphor that I'm trying to draw upon, okay? Um, and this is a user-centered alternative to the traditional marketing funnel. Everybody here is familiar with a marketing funnel, maybe? Like uh, awareness, consideration, decision, that kind of thing. So uh, funnels are, by definition, one-directional, right? You put stuff in the top and things come out the bottom. In the marketing case, it's you put leads in the top and, and deals come out the bottom, which is great, but what, that's one transaction? So the flywheel is focused on like, you know, circular value, right? Iterative value and iterative learning to create that value. And so marketers in particular find a lot of value in this kind of model because so much revenue is driven by repeat customers and referrals. We'll go back to Starbucks, for example, right? Starbucks royalty, uh, loyalty program, you know, people getting gold memberships and that sort of thing. Um, people like to go back to the places they know and the places they trust. My husband and I go to a place in San Diego called the Turf Club. They did not pay for that plug. The Turf Club is great. We go every Tuesday. Um, and, and that's because we find a lot of value in that experience, right? And so that's what this is about. It's about, like, learning what your customer wants, how to get them to trust you, and what motivates them to buy. So for the next 20 minutes, put your seatbelts on, get ready. Here we go. I'm going to teach you about the flywheel. Uh, so it starts with customers at the center of the flywheel. Um, people in marketing are used to traditional market, user re or market research. And market research values demographic data, right? Your age, your income, your marital status, your gender. Well, user research is a little bit different than that. Um, instead of like surveys, we rely mostly on one-on-one -on -one interviews and we focus on people's motivations, self-identity, attitudes, behaviors, and context of use. So I'm gonna give you a really good example to help you delineate between market research and user research. Imagine two customers. They're white men. They were born in 1948 they were raised in Great Britain, they're married, and they're very successful, like super wealthy. One of them lives in a castle. The other lives in a mansion, both really wealthy. Furthermore, uh, both of them have uh, two children, or maybe more. Uh, they like dogs, and they love the Alps. Got a good understanding of who these guys might be? Cool. Prince Charles is one of them, and the other's Ozzy Osbourne. From a market research perspective, these guys are very similar. 
from a user research, research perspective, they could not be more different. And so statistical customer descriptions are important in certain contexts, but a true understanding of people's habits, culture, social context, and motivations of users is really crucial to marketing. It's how you can define a better value proposition or make better offers. Cool, so there's three parts to the UX flywheel. The first is desire. Desire is really difficult to manufacture. I'm married now, my husband's in the audience, uh, but I remember how frustrated I was with a guy that I was trying to date a few years ago. We're gonna call him Eric. Eric was tall, he was handsome, and he was a doctor. My mom would have been so proud, but despite my best efforts, I just wasn't that into him. There was no desire. Desire is, is, is more than a want, right? It's something that's innate within us. And, and so making things that people want is far greater than making people want things, which is usually where marketers tend to, tend to sit, right? In the UX world, we want to make things that people want. And UX methods help you understand what people really want, deep down inside, what they desire. And that understanding helps you bring uh, design and describe new products in a way that will resonate with users. And that results in a strong market position. The second ingredient is trust. Trust is earned through consistency of behavior delivered repeatedly. Influencer marketing, one of those tactics that I mentioned earlier, that's a really good example of, of trust. Um, it's largely driven because content creators consistently deliver on their promise to create content. Whether you're a Kardashian or a Twitch gamer, those, those influencers are consistently delivering the content they said they were gonna deliver, and that builds an audience that trusts them because they're, they're there with commitment and consistency every single day. And the th so uh, UX methods can, can help you understand how people expect a product to work and why they prefer one thing over another. And th this results in clearer and more effective messaging, right? So desire, Understanding desire is about positioning, and trust is about messaging. And I'm oversimplifying for the sake of, of making a point, but desire and trust, those are the first two ingredients. And the final ingredient is action. My buddy Dave pointed out in that LinkedIn post that 99% of people only read headlines. Well, what's the point of discovering what people want and getting them to trust you if you can't turn that into revenue? According to most reports, it takes an average of seven touch points for, sa for sales and marketing to be effective. Seven, I didn't come up with that number. Sounds like a lot at first, but when you realize you only have seven chances to get somebody like into the funnel and then turn that into value for, for your company or for the customer, it's actually not a lot of chances. So action is a bit more complex because sometimes you're driving it like with a big CTA and sometimes you're supporting it with a help document. Um, when, you're, when you're driving action, you can employ um, Cialdini's six principles. Is anybody familiar with Robert Cialdini, Principles of Persuasion? Great. If you're, if you're not familiar, there's a book called Influence by this guy. And I'm gonna rattle these off for you. Um, the six principles of persuasion, and we use these all the time in, in marketing projects at Blink, are liking, authority, commitment, reciprocity, social proof, and scarcity. Liking, authority, commitment, reciprocity, social proof, and scarcity. Those things are all proven to drive action. When you're supporting action, it's a bit more complicated, but this is a marketing talk, so I'm going to say them one more time for you. Cialdini's six principles of persuasion liking, authority, commitment, reciprocity, social proof, and scarcity, right? These are, these are scarcity is a, is a deal that's got a limited time offer, like that $200 discount to convey UX that's only valid until, I don't know, doesn't say, February 1st. Now I added a layer of scarcity, right? Reciprocity, the $200 discount, that's reciprocity. Social proof, Leo, in the audience has been there four times. Social proof. Oh, five times. All right. 
Um, hopefully you're liking me, right? Um, so the, the Cialdini's six principles of persuasion are really, really good at helping to drive action. Um, and I know that this is a group of designers, so I, I just want to point out that design is its own form of a language, and design systems are a form of commitment and consistency, which is one of the principles of persuasion, right? When a, when a system looks like you expect it to and behaves the way you expect it to, you begin to trust it, and you're more likely to give up your your data, and your credit card. So, that's the three elements of the UX flywheel, desire, trust, and action. Again, each time that you spin a flywheel, uh, it gets more momentum, it gains more speed, and more power. And the, the idea in the marketing context is that each time you're learning more about your customer, right? Are they more of a Prince Charles, or are they more of an Ozzy Osbourne? You're gonna learn what they want deep down inside, how to get them to trust you, and what motivates them to buy. And the faster you spin the wheel, the stronger your team becomes. Cool, now for some case studies. Um, so I'm gonna like overlay the flywheel on the first one just to try to like make the point of, of how the flywheel works. Um, we worked with Moen to create an IOT shower head. Uh, so, that sounds crazy. Who the hell needs a smart shower? Um, here's the, the sort of skinny on it. Um, Moen had created this new technology, a digital thermostatic valve. Who the hell needs a digital thermostatic valve? Well, scientific use cases need it. Um, digital thermostatic valves were created for uh, uses in a laboratory. They're very precise at regulating temperature. I want, a, I want a temperature, I want a shower that's 110 degrees. Um, but people didn't quite understand what that was going to be, right? So we helped Moen position their product in a way that was attractive to people. Um, the valve was Moen's IP, but, but Blink helped them create an interface for the user and, and, a, and a value proposition and a use case that made sense for the hardware. So all of Moen's IP is actually behind the wall. It, it's, it's, the, it's the plumbing behind it. Of course, there's this mobile app, but the, the innovation that they came to us with was this valve system. So the first thing we did was we started to talk to people, and we said, what do you think you might get from a smart shower? And we learned that the valve system, um, again, was, was not all that important in our, in our upfront discovery. We were talking to the Moen engineers and, you know, tell us about this thing. And, sorry, not that it wasn't important. It's, it was very important to the way that the shower works, but it, it, customers weren't interested in that. Um, but what was really important was that we learned it wasn't an easy upgrade to existing showers. It was actually for people building new homes or doing a major remodel, right? Because you were going to have to replace valve systems behind your wall. So the, the customer is not you and me that like have a shower at home or are renting an apartment, the customer was, was home builders or contractors. Oh, and they're gonna have to like resell this thing. So that's what we learned through some foundational research. Uh, we also learned that the, the, the U by Moen can accommodate up to four shower heads. I have one shower head. <laughs> four shower heads is a dream, right? So this is like a premium product. Um, so the next layer of the flywheel, right, is about trust. Uh, so we created wireframes and wrote specifications so that we could explain how the system would work, and we tested the prototype with users in a simulated shower. Yeah, in our usability labs. Um, it was pretty crude. It was actually just a series of whiteboards. Um, but we asked them to stand between these whiteboards and, and um, you know, go through the motions as they would with this prototype application. And I don't have a video to show this particular piece, but um, suffice to say, when people get into the shower, they take their glasses off. And as soon as they did that, we had this like epiphany, oh God, we know where this is going, right? We have this very dense interface on this candy bar phone kind of thing, and people could not tell what it said. And so they couldn't trust the interface that we put in front of them because they couldn't 
read it with their glasses off. And in hindsight, it sounds so obvious, and that's true of so many UX insights, right? Water is wet, the stove is hot, but you don't know until you experience that thing. And this is totally an example of that. So we iterated on the user interface, and we decided we needed to make the temperature really big front and center. The other thing we had to iterate on was the color palette, because when people saw orange or red, they thought the water was hot, like really, really, really hot. And of course it is. So we learned that people like to be in this like purple zone. So the color palette totally omits reds, oranges, and even most yellows. Um, and we, we instead focused on um, a, a, a more limited color palette with, with more saturation, and then really emphasized the size of the temperature. So there's one example of how we could use the flywheel to help define a market position and a value proposition. Uh, I'm going to show a video next. Uh, the video is a, uh, us prototyping a uh, Alexa skill for the shower. And so this is not a, an actual on the market product, but this is us showing how people might interact with an Alexa skill and proving or disproving whether or not there's a market for a voice activated shower. Um, so this research method is called uh, the Wizard of Oz technique. And uh, this is some interesting footage that I think is really rich and teaches us about um, desire, trust, and action all at once. And I'm going to hope the audio works for you streamers at home and you folks in the audience. Oh. Mac, can you help me out? Have you ever used uh, virtual reality before? I have used it once a while ago. You have? Yeah, so which, which devices have you used? The Oculus Rift, uh, the HTC Vive. Yeah, I don't own the, the set or anything, but I've like been to places that have demos and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like you to just uh, just start to go through your normal shower routine. Oh, weird. Okay. Oh yeah. I'll just annotate. So we're asking people if they've used VR before, and some of them have, and some of them haven't. And they're telling us about that, and they're putting the headset on, and looking around at this gorgeous <laughs> VR shower nice that we shower. built for them. We prototyped this whole environment. One okay. person is like, Whoa, I love you. I am standing just to the outside bathroom. of the shower. Uh, well, there's Juicy. double sinks. That's kind of nice. Look at all those shower on. Whoa, that's a big shower. Whoa, hey, shower goodness. Turn on. Okay, cool. Right. Uh, so I wish you could hear the audio. Thank but you. Uh, what, what you can see is uh, on the main Turn screen on. what they're seeing inside of the Welcome VR headset, and in the lower screen is, is our, our video. Right. You can hear it on the stream. That's cool. Well, sorry for you guys here. You got me. Okay. Uh, pleasant so you English can see in the lower right, and this is pretty typical lady. of how we do user research shower on? at Blink. Um, there's right. like, there's shower what is the user interacting with, and then you know a, a, a one or more cameras That's trained fun. on the user right themselves. <laughs> um, what's really interesting about um, this is we're, cool. we're oh, ooh, that's a nice listening to and learning about people's um, innate expectations shower increase around the temperature how they're going to interact with shower. I think we called it Nemo, right. trying Amazing to like protect the brand, you know, because we're just doing okay. discovery. Can, do uh, people know how to use this thing <laughs> no, or like, interested what's this? in it? Make it hotter. <laughs> so, you know, do you tell the shower to go hotter or colder? But the 105 is not change, so I guess it's not a... Uh, temperature gauge. A, a specific temperature to it. Okay. Um, so now on we're or off. Oh, it, it. Smart bulbs, and we have like the smart LEDs, and we have Google Home, 
And I actually I might use it. It's an old Blink logo. Um, so the, you heard the woman at the end say, I'm sure it could be an Alexa skill. Um, we, what you missed from the first part of it, and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, we didn't test that slide, obviously, um, is we didn't use uh, an Alexa voice. We didn't use the, the Moen uh, brand name. You know, we're trying to like be absent. Part of why you come to, to an independent research facility is to like you know, obfuscate all of that stuff, right? And see if people naturally connect the dots. Um, so it was really interesting for people to, to say, yeah, I would use it, and why wouldn't it just be an Alexa skill? That stuff starts to help validate the assumptions or hypotheses that we had going into it. Uh, we also learned a whole lot about the kinds of commands people would want to give, and that's really, really important in voice, because in a graphical user interf interface, people have some kind of a prompt Right? I'm going to click on file, I'm going to click on print, and it's going to go to the machine. In voice, Alexa is either great or she's a real bitch. Right? Like, it either works or it doesn't. There's no training for it. All right. Uh, the next case study I want to tell you about, and this is the last one. Uh, ten slides left, and I've got some time for Q&A if, if that's your thing. Um, is about Sumo Logic. Sumo Logic is a B2B software as a service application. Um, and th what they do is they ingest log data, uh, which is like the exhaust from any application that you use, and they help businesses transform that into insight. It's really complicated, heady shit. Um, so this is what a, one of our whiteboards looked like after our discovery phase. We were trying to like affinity diagram what we had learned from stakeholders. Um, we conducted more than a dozen stakeholder interviews um, over the course of this project where we articulated goals and identified areas where the team was misaligned, as naturally happens in a growth stage startup. Um, and most importantly for our project, where the website really needed to be improved. And you can, you can unpack some of that stuff, what's strong and what's weak and whatnot. Um, and although the design would be the most obvious change, it was clear the value proposition and the content strategy also needed to improve. So, um, this is like a hint at, at content strategy. Um, one analysis that we use at Blink uh, to, to determine that is we look at the reading level from, uh, it's called the Flesh, Fle Flesh or Fleisch Kincaid grade level score. Um, and it, so it calculates this based on a number of different parameters. And eighth grade is a really good level for website copy. And you can see Sumo Logic was coming in here about ninth grade. So not, not terrible but not anywhere near as good as Slack. Slack has like super friendly, fifth grade reading level copy on their website. Um, so you go, okay, well Slack's like, it's a chat messenger. You know, it's easy to explain. Well, Elk, that's Elasticsearch, New Relic, and Splunk are all comparable products to, to Sumo Logic and all were able to create messaging and, and language that was far easier to understand. And how do you create desire, right, if the language is not something that somebody can understand? It's a really objective metric. You know, if, if your copy cannot be understood by somebody without a college degree, then it's not gonna be broadly desirable to people. So one of the things we do was look for commas and semicolons and copy and like simplify the sentence structure, use words that have less syllables. Uh, that kind of thing we find makes a product generally more appealing and easier to understand. Uh, here you can see we're discussing personas. We're in this big like workshop room. Um, you know, again, market research personas tend to really focus on, on demographics. In this particular case, we looked at mental models. Uh, and so the mental models that we came out with um, for this customer, for this client, were the slow jogger, the all out sprinter, and the mindful runner. And so they all had significant buying power depending on the, the 
type of organization that they were in, but they approached the software buying process differently. Um, so they were all very technical, like, and all engineers and, and all what we would call a technical decision maker. But they had different use cases, and, and some of them would delegate the sign-up process to, to people underneath them. You know, you're going to sign up and try all the product. Some of them would actually deploy the user agent and collect the data themselves, and others would delegate that out to, to someone else. So the, the all-out sprinter, they were, for whatever reason, very motivated. They were going to skip any kind of like resources and that kind of thing. They were going to go straight to sign up and, and get their, their product going as soon as possible. It was free, so why not, why not try it out for a month? Uh, the mindful runner uh, was going to look at basic product information, um, look at the product stack and maybe the how it works section, and then um, and then sign up. And then finally, the the slow jogger, they were really going to take their time. They were going to come back five or six times uh, before finally delegating someone else to look at it. And they wanted case studies and resources um, to to look at. Um, so we did some concept testing to to gain insights into the information architecture. So we recruited people, right, who look like these, these three different buyer types um, uh, to do concept testing and understand how they would uh, respond to different information architectures. Uh, we did a final round of, te of testing, and that was about trust, right? How, do, how Can they infer and understand how this content is organized, and do they trust the product based on sort of how we position it? Uh, then we did a final round of testing to understand could they complete the user journey? Could they, could they find the resources that they needed? Could they sign up successfully? And that was about action. Um, so anyways, this is us doing a value proposition canvas. Um, I, I'm really personally big into these like Mad Lib things. I think generally people have a good idea of what their value proposition is or what their content strategy is. Um, it's just about aligning teams. And so this is a, an exercise to get people to align and understand that the nuance between words is, is important in some contexts, but generally people are facing the, the same direction. Um, this is us doing a concept test. So there's, there's an a, B, a version and a B version, and then we're sort of interrogating it. Um, let's see, well, I have some notes here. It's been a year since we did this project. Um, Part, this is what we observed in concept testing. Uh, these participants would consistently try to interpret explicit meaning from all visual elements. So that meant icons should be literal, not abstract, and that diagrams must tell a sensible and easy to understand story. Some participants conflated machine data with machine learning. So machine data is the logs that come out of your machine. That's different than machine learning, which is an algorithm. So um, they said machine data didn't adequately describe the predictive nature of the platform, while analytics downplays the total capabilities. So what we learned is we couldn't use the word machine data because people were misinterpreting what it meant. Right? It didn't mean machine learning. So we had to say log data and machine learning. We could not say the word machine data. If you're really geeky, you understand the difference there. If you don't, you can see why it's confusing. Um, also, participants said that uh, distinguishing by use cases, operations, security, and business, that that was helpful in them understanding um, what they could expect and, and what path they should go down based on what their particular use case was. That was a win for us. Uh, so that resulted in this like really massive, this is like a 2,000 page website. So here's a, a high level view of what the design system looked like. Uh, you know, we, we had to settle on uh, not just like colors and type, but also layouts and graphical treatments and, you know, what was the icon style going to be. Uh, I'm pretty uh, excited I'm going to go off the frame here. Uh, this particular thing that says monitor in real time, uh, act on threats instantly, and I don't know what the last one was, but we came up with this inside of Blink uh, for the website. And Sumo Logic liked that so much, they turned that into their booth display. So like they go to AWS reInvent and whatnot, and that's like the backdrop for, their, for um, their booth. So even though we were focused on this website, that turned into a really good, compelling, succinct value proposition for three different user audiences that was useful to them. So that was a big win. That is a slide that won't work. That's, now I know why the speaker notes aren't working. That's a slide that's not finished. Um, I have a copy of this deck for Lee. 
I worked on my original. Cool. I owe that to the Cowboy Star uh, <laughs> Manhattan or old fashioned. Uh, anyway, so that's the three elements of the flywheel desire, trust, and action. You spin it, you get stronger, you get faster.